So today marks the end of our two-month series on the book of Revelation. And I would like to just revisit really briefly why we decided to dig into this book for such a long time. This summer, as we were heading into the, the heat of the election season, um, I thought that it would be helpful for us as a congregation to reflect on the relationship between the church and politics. And I think that we on the teaching team were pretty honest from the outset about our goals for this series. Um, and ultimately our goal was to strengthen our devotion to Jesus and to God in a moment of possible temptation. And I say temptation, um, maybe for myself, uh, but maybe you all felt a little tempted during that election season as well. Um, and what I mean is that um, when we are unsettled or when we're anxious um, or when we are afraid, we are tempted to clutch at things that we think just might save us from disaster or, or pain or any kind of suffering. And in those moments, we can forget that Jesus calls us to what seems like an almost paradoxical way of being in the world. So on the one hand, Jesus calls us to love people and the world indiscriminately. Friends, enemies, families, um, Jesus tells us we are to love the same. But at the same time, Jesus also seems to encourage a level of detachment from the world as well. Um, and a level of detachment from the ways of people. And so Revelation tells or told ancient Christians, and it tells Christians today, that we are citizens of a completely different order. Revelation begins with that language. You are citizens of something else. Um, and also that this order, which Jesus calls the kingdom of God, that it works in ways completely different from the ways of this world. So for instance, politics is basically a competition for power. And can any of us think of any time in scripture where Jesus teaches us to compete for power? I couldn't think of any. Um, now, I know that this line of thinking might seem simplistic or a little too black and white. Um, I am not arguing that we should completely retreat from political involvement. Um, but I do think that political power um, is similar to wealth in that once you have it, um, it's really hard to imagine not having it. Um, it seems almost impossible to willingly give it up for something that seems less utilitarian or less effective. So in these two months, we definitely did not cover every chapter and verse of Revelation. We had to make some choices about where we were gonna spend our time. And I'm gonna just give a really brief summary of, of some of the things that we talked about. So we started with John's introduction to Revelation and we saw that Revelation is actually part of an ancient literary genre called apocalypse. Um, and that word means to uncover something or to reveal something. So um, John's apocalypse is uh, a revealing of something that God wanted to show him. And we also saw that Revelation was highly influenced by the only other apocalypse in the Bible. Um, anybody remember what that is? Daniel, yeah, the book of Daniel. Um, and that is another story about an exile who is trying to be faithful to God in a hostile place. After that, we jump to the middle of Revelation to the two beasts. And like in the book of Daniel and other apocalypses, the beasts represent a worldly empire. And in this case, uh, the Roman empire and its cult of emperor worship. Uh, we then looked at chapter 12. This was the chapter called The Woman and the Dragon. 
Um, and that in that chapter, um, Satan, who is symbolized by the dragon, pursues a woman who we think represents the people of God and who is about to give birth to the Messiah. Um, and this vision showed us that Satan envies Jesus's authority. Satan wants to be the one um, to accuse us and to condemn us. Um, and we also saw that um, Satan has been defeated in heaven and he is lashing out on earth because that he knows that his time on earth is short and his power is short. Um, then we looked at um, scenes of heavenly worship. So in chapter four, uh, we saw the cosmic throne room um, where God, who is the creator of all that exists, is worshiped by all of creation. And then this is followed by um, the revelation of the Lion of Judah, um, who in a twist is actually revealed to be a lamb. Um, and the lamb we saw is the one who reveals the course of history. It's the lamb who is worthy to um, unseal the scroll, which tells us how the end of history will happen. Then we looked at the fall of Babylon or the fall of Rome. And um, we heard God's indictment of Rome's economic system, um, that its appetite is voracious, um, that ultimately it is empty and oppressive and greedy, and that uh, the system devours human beings and human souls. And finally, last week, um, we looked at the rider on the white horse, who is called the Word of God. Um, and from his mouth, comes a sword, and he comes in righteousness to make war and to judge and to defeat evil. And um, we acknowledged that for some of us, for many of us, um, this is a difficult way of thinking about Jesus as someone who comes to make war. Um, we tend to focus on the Jesus of the Gospels, um, which also includes judgment, um, but both of these aspects of Jesus are important. Uh, mercy, grace, and forgiveness, where it is sought, but also judgment and the ultimate destruction. So this brings us um, to the final passage in Revelation that we're going to spend time with, and I'm going to read it. Um, and I'm really not going to talk about it very much. Because to me, it seems pretty self-explanatory of where this vision goes. Um, so I'm going to read a selection from Revelation 21 and 22. Um, it's a mix. This is, I'll start with Revelation 21 verses 1 through 7. And this comes after um, the judgment of the living and the dead. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Then one of the seven angels came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, 
the wife of the lamb. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. For the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his, servant, his servants what must soon take place. See, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And so according to this revelation given to John, God will descend to live among mortals and to fulfill the promise of Isaiah, um, that, who says that God in the end will make all things new. Um, so now what I would like to do is spend some time um, maybe breaking up into two groups and I would just like for people to share um, some of our takeaways from this series and from the book of Revelation. Um, so did the series or the book of Revelation, did it challenge you? If it did, in what ways? Um, I'm particularly curious about whether uh, it gave you hope. Um, did it deepen your trust in God? Um, that was our goal. <laughs> Don't feel pressure to say yes if it didn't. Um, or any other major takeaways that you took away from this series. Um, so we're going to break into groups. We'll talk. And then um, I'd like to regather and maybe share some of those things with the larger group.